So now, after hearing all about innovations in Marvis, after hearing about AFC and the best part, dynamic packet, uh, RF spectrum capture. So while we're bringing the slides up, I'll be talking to you about the new things we've been doing in location services. Just to give you a primer on location services, what we offer as part of our same MIS cloud architecture, our same access points, is a lot of location-based use cases that we can enable. Um, and that implies we can deliver a blue dot on a wayfinding application. We can deliver asset visibility, be it assets in hospitals, be it IT asset management in higher ed, or even in uh, corporate space enterprises. Along with that, we also deliver an analytics platform. This analytics platform, and I'll be talking to you about later today as well, gives you insights into how your network is doing with respect to all the SLEs, but also gives you insights into traffic analysis in terms of how are people moving through your premises, right? Uh, UC talked about live view of how RF is doing. What we use analytics for is also a live view of how people are navigating your spaces. Um, so yeah, last but not least, along with enabling the blue dot on a mobile application for wayfinding, essentially delivering your indoor GPS experience with our partners who bring the app to the table, we bring the most accurate blue dot to the table. Uh, that same platform, the same APs, leveraging our Bluetooth low energy antenna arrays in our flagship APs deliver asset visibility. Asset visibility is coming up a lot in, like I said, I talked about healthcare already, but also in recently in higher ed, IT asset management or in corporate spaces, where are my devices in terms of uh, either locating lost devices or just an audit of where my inventory is of where my corporate managed devices. All of that comes together with our analytics. So the analytics, we give you a view into how traffic is flowing, but most recently, again, a trend I've been seeing is, tell me how my space is being utilized, especially now with people coming back into work, everything going online, physically in premise again, People want to see how spaces are being utilized. Now, these are the capabilities we've always had for the last many years. What I'll be talking to you about today is how we've made it even easier to consume these capabilities. Beth, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So one of the biggest friction points of deploying a network used to be, hey, how do I make sure that my installation actually matches my build? So what you see in Resplendent earlier of ingesting a floor plan, ingesting the AP placements, well, is the AP placed exactly where it was supposed to be placed when I got the build plan? Last year, Wes and I spoke to you about auto placement on a single map, right? Where we could range against APs, use machine learning, use our BLA arrays to get directionality and place APs on the floor plan. But then the question came, what do I do about multi-floor buildings? Because yes, I can give you a view of APs on a floor plan based on what my location engine is saying, where the AP estimates are, but you, you know, many deployments are multi-floor deployments. What do you do in that situation? How do you build a multi-floor view of AP placements? So previously, we would ask you to tell the system what APs were on the map, put them in a corner, and we'll automatically place them. What we have now worked on, Beth, can next slide, please, is enabling what we call a clustering mechanism. So what we are doing, and I'll give you a demonstration of this shortly, is all we need now is a reference or two on two APs on every floor. And then we will automatically form a cluster of what is the AP grouping per floor and then place them on that floor plan, right? This again is using the same foundation. It's using machine learning. It's using our directional BLE array for knowing which APs are in what direction from each other. It's also using 11p <laughs> for the initial ranging. But once that is done, once all the information is gathered, it is now able to place APs on multiple maps. So no longer do you need to know all the APs per floor in a multi-floor deployment. Just give us two or three APs per floor plan and we will do the rest. Did yes. Say, can this be interfaced with, if you have one that has a GPS in it and lock on so you can use standard power? Yes, when we get that capability, we will be fusing that together, right? This is in the case of when I don't have that, uh, that ability, what can I do now for my deployments, right? And this can again work for both brownfield and greenfield because your build versus plan, you have issues all the time, right? Did you say easy? 
MC. 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 I was like, whoa, hold on. So, um, um, <laughs> so for this, are you using BLE or are you using MC? Both. 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 <laughs> because when we did the, when we began, you know, a year and a half ago on our single floor placement of APs automatically on the floor plan based on uh, the ranging, what we found was an issue called flip ambiguity. So even though I'm ranging, I would find APs that are placed on opposite directions of each other. And that is where with the directional Bluetooth antenna array that we have, I'm able to give you even a higher level of efficacy to know, no, this AP may be ranging against each other, but they're actually this way versus this way. And this we've seen, I would say, in three out of five deployments, six out of 10, we found this issue that the BLA array came to you know, the rescue saying, this is where the actual placement is. No. And is this still service disruption <laughs> as far as the actual process? It is. Okay. It is, yeah. Right. The AP orientation is not because that's using primarily only Bluetooth. That can run in the background. But when you're doing auto placement because I need to do ranging from one AP the, to another, the, it is service disruption. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Have, you, have you done uh, some testing like on highly reflective environments? And we have run this in warehouses. We have run this in, in uh, office spaces. We have run this in uh, schools. In schools, we run into other interesting uh, scenarios where not only are we talking about clustering on one floor, I mean, on multiple floors, we're also talking about different clusters on the same floor plan. Because you'll have classrooms, then you'll have an auditorium or a, or a basketball stadium, you'll have classrooms again. So we were able to solve that as well with this grouping mechanism. Awesome. So how this works essentially is, um, Beth, if you don't mind starting. Yeah, so you, uh, you're used to seeing auto placement per floor plan. Now it goes at the site level, all the floor plans at that site. You click auto placement. We ask you this time for just two or three reference APs, not anchor APs, just reference APs, because that is what we will then use to create the relative cluster. Or what are the other APs that are in the neighborship of, of these APs? With that, we then give you a view of all the APs that we found on the floor plan. We also give you a confidence score. Because that is what tells us that these APs I'm placing with high confidence on this floor plan, that they are truly on, on this solution. That's also helped us on the single floor mapping. And that's it. You accept the, the APs we found. You do have the option to deselect if you think certain APs should not be there. Uh, and the remaining APs that you selected will automatically place on the floor plan. And this is the same process you would do for every floor. Just give us two or three reference APs that you know that are on that floor plan. The rest we will automatically group and place. So, Lenny, is there any um, recommendations on which couple you should set for references? Far apart, corners, see each other? Anywhere in the center, see each other. Yeah. This is, um, so this is available, right, um, currently? Per floor, it is available. This is now doing multi-floor at the same time is what's coming out new this quarter. Okay. But so, the, again, the key difference is today you would have to tell us all the APs that are on a map, and then we would place them for you. Now just give us two or three reference APs, we place the rest. You don't have to give us the entire cluster of APs. We will learn the clusters, we will learn the groupings. Oh, so it will automatically pull it from... Exactly. You don't have to give us the pool of APs anymore on okay. that floor plan. So I just wanted to clarify with Keith's question. You said APs in the center, but you're saying those reference APs need to hear each other? Those reference APs can be any reference APs. So there is a... Uh, Good question. There's a concept of anchor APs and reference APs. In the case of anchor APs, we typically suggest to you what anchors to recommend because sometimes we get anchor APs that are not quite the most cohesive to give us the best uh, view. The reference AP concept, just for us to say, ideally, they should be able to hear each other. At least two should have line of sight because then that is what we will use as they can hear each other and what else can they hear. And then the ranging starts for each AP. Okay. So it's again just one reference point for us to build the view, right? Yeah. Now, ideally, would, when, when the GPS comes into play, I won't even need that because then I'll have GPS as an anchor per floor so I can actually build the 3D view versus right now the 2D view, right? Um, awesome. how, how much uh, overhead is generated when you're discovering and once it's discovering, kind of like settle on a plan, does it keep doing it or is it reducing the amount of overhead? There's no overhead per se because the ranging is happening in a maintenance window and typically it takes about 30 seconds to 40 seconds per AP per floor plan. So if you have 40 APs, it should take about 20 to 30 minutes to get done. And then it's, it's running. There's no back-end monitoring per se. You had a question? No. no. So yeah. uh, after the auto placements, yeah. if there are any 
accuracy issues, you have an option to drag and drop it. Absolutely. Wherever yeah. you want. And that's why the conference level comes into play, you know, very critical because you can see there are APs we've placed with high conference. The APs, we actually will tell you we have medium to low conference. If you want to exclude those and do them manually on the floor plan, you can. Any other questions? Yeah. The next thing we did is um, auto zone creation. So I talked about analytics, right? Analytics, like I said, is very, very interesting for your line of business teams, be it marketing teams in retail, be it facilities teams in, in higher ed or, uh, or again, corporate enterprise office spaces, right? The biggest pain point we have seen is, yes, we can provide analytics, but then how do you make the analytics more contextual? That requires the line of business teams to work with the network IT teams to create what we call zones on the floor plan. And that typically takes time because, you know, the network IT says, hey, I don't know what, where you want zones. You guys tell me. And the facilities people say, yeah, yeah I'll tell you, I, but I need the data right away. Right. So that, that friction point is always there. So we took that as a problem and said, in the spirit of making it easy, how can we even make zone creation easy? So using image recognition and text recognition, now we will be able to, once we ingest the floor plan, automatically define what we call boundaries or edges on the floor plan and automatically create zones. So the process now becomes ingest the floor plan, auto place APs, auto zone, your network is up and running for providing Wi-Fi services, location services, as well as analytics, right? All in the in single clicks of buttons. In your preferences to have have that floor plan uploaded from your site survey tool, or your plan is your preference to have that data pulled down to the site survey, like with the Hamana integration, right? It would you, be you would from the in, but you, but they would pull it out, right? Correct. Would, okay. Or vice versa. Either as long as I have an image, I'm using that image to basically recognize areas and give them into maps. But right? but in general, like the image plus the areas plus the locations of the APs and all of that stuff, right? When when Hamana pulls down your floor plan, it's going to inject. It will ingest that as well. Of all of that data, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. So it'll get the benefits of the auto placement because now it'll know this is what I'd recommended, this is what was installed, these are the new AP placements. Okay. Right? So, but the way this works again, the goal is always how do we make it very easy for customers, partners to consume location services. There's always a friction of deployments, of fingerprinting, of placement validation, and then zone creation. Deployment made easy already. Fingerprinting no longer needed because of unsupervised machine learning. Placement now made easy with auto placement, now also multi-floor. And the last bastion was zone creation. That also we're hoping with this automatic ability to create zones on a floor plan. Beth, if you don't mind clicking through. Uh, just because I can recognize the edges and areas, I can automatically start creating zones on the floor plan. What's the, the, the distance, um, what's the word I'm looking for? How accurate is it? What's the accuracy from when you're doing auto, auto placement of these APs? More. We've seen about roughly 1.49 meters okay. of that of all the <laughs> <Roughly. plus laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One point give, give, give or take a point three. <laughs> <laughs> What's the criteria used for the zone? It looks like it's breaking it on hallways. So every place would. So typically rooms, right? So based on use cases we've seen for the line of business teams to want data, they want to know conference room one, conference room two, conference room three. Cube areas, there could be a marketing area, sales area, and R&D area. So based on the image recognition, we will try and automatically segment the areas. What looks like a cube farm, we'll create one, one zone there. What looks like rooms, we'll automatically create zones over there. If that area has text, we'll automatically name the zone with that text as well. Again, to make it very easy for customers to start getting analytics right away on what is my occupancy in these areas. So, so, so was but the, these can be adjusted as well. So what's the criteria for like defining those zones? Can you define by, I don't know. By we always had the manual process of creating zones where you could just go on the floor plan and basically draw out a polygon and say this is zone one, zone two, zone three. But that's where the friction point would come because the IT teams want to know what the line of business wants. The line of business wants data, but would not ever spend time to create the zones on the floor plan. This is why we auto create them to make it easy to consume analytics. I'm assuming right. that you can have them auto created and just delete the ones that you don't want. Exactly, and adjust them if you if you want them. So, so can so I'm thinking um, in a scenario thinking like uh, voice over IP deployments, right? Microsoft Teams and all that kind of stuff. Can this data be used as somehow integrated into? Teams or for e like 911. Uh, 911 is the, yeah. It potentially could because the APIs are there. We already do zone entries, zone exit events. So okay. Yeah. But like there's, 
there's or is there something already uh, in we already August have e nine one integrations like for with red sky for example via apis this has become another element right okay. now there are, more systems use ap connection and the ap placement right zone becomes more contextual more useful okay. and that for that also we have api okay cool yeah so are there any hard limits on the number of floors nope can be, can be okay this is microservices cloud at its best no limits <laughs> <laughs> Is there any additional subscription to get that enabled using the auto zones? Auto? Part of base Wi-Fi. Okay. So. Oh, wait, there's no, so asset, no. Uh, B B if you already have assets, you get auto zone, auto placement with it. If you already have Wi-Fi, you get auto zone, auto placement along with it. Okay, so just like basic wireless assurance actually gives you this? Yeah, you get auto placement with basic Wi-Fi. You get uh, auto zone, you will get auto zone when it's available with basic Wi-Fi. Okay. Uh, really quickly, I'm like negative five now, Beth. Uh, <laughs> so, if you don't mind going, we'll just skip to the, a lot of you may already be familiar with Premalytics. Again, it's our observability dashboard for longer term insights, longer term trends. It becomes your CIO dashboard, your, your CMO dashboard to just know, hey, how, how many people in my locations or how is my network doing looking at SLEs. But the key things we've added recently that you will see, start seeing this quarter is also tied to some of the innovations we announced today. So we talked about Zoom and Teams integration. But if you don't mind clicking through, uh, keep going. So one of the new dashboards coming in is, along with the NAC uh, capabilities that Slava talked to you through, we'll also be giving you a longer term observability dashboard on NAC Insights, right? How many clients coming in through my NAC solution per site, per SSID? What is my overall client connection uh, trend coming in through my NAC service? And then even more importantly, we're always looking at good experiences, bad experiences, right? So if there were NAC failure events, what was the most failed issue that I saw, right? Was it certificate failures or bad passwords? What was it? We show that as a trend as well. So again, more insights into the NAC solution with Premalytics coming as well as part of your NAC subscription. Uh, next one, Beth. This is uh, Zoom and Teams. So we are building this large experience model as Sudhir and Bob spoke to you about, where we are able to measure the application experience for collaboration apps. But then the question come, always comes over time, how are my applications doing? How are my users doing with these applications? That again is where we are be announcing a, a meeting insights dashboard where you look, we can look at good experience, bad experience minutes over time. So when our model says here is the root cause of why there's a bad experience and you fix that root cause, you can see your good experience minutes going back up and your bad experience minutes going back down. You can look at overall calls per site, calls per WLAN, uh, calls per WAN interface, because that's again where what we're using as data to say good experience or bad experience. And again, over a longer term, right? Could be a month, two months, three months, a year worth of data. Can you combine that with the location analytics to show the area of the office that the bad calls are happening in? Exactly where that this will go next. <laughs> so. Cool. And, and then the last one that we're announcing uh, that will be coming out this quarter is enhancements on our sustainability analytics. So as we've been uh, going deeper and deep, deeper into the wired network, sustainability has been coming up a lot as, hey, what visibility can you give me on what is my power usage on my wired network? And then the question would come to say, hey, how much headroom do I have? What is my power budget available and what am I already using? Because as I'm adding more IoT devices, I may have switch ports, but do I have the PoE capability to power those ports or, and give power to my IoT devices? So whether it was, what is my current power usage? Or whether the question was, how much headroom do I have to add more devices to my current wired stack? This is where the sustainability analytics are coming into play. So now you can look at overall Hey, what is my overall PA utilization? Am I maxing out on some switches or do I have enough capacity on some others? What is the highest PA utilization on, on which switch in the stack across my sites? As well as the trending of PA utilization as you use more ports and devices plugged into switches. So 